Hello and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. I happen today, however, to be sitting in a home in Ramsbottom, England. I kid you not. I've never been here before. I came over to teach this week a course on the Gospels for the International Reformed Baptist Seminary. And uh, we've just completed the week. It's Friday evening and the class is over. And I asked a couple of fellows if they would be kind enough to sit down with me to have a conversation with me about a ministry that you may or may not have heard of. It's a publishing ministry here in the UK. It's called Broken Wharf. And that's broken and then W-H-A-R-F-E. And you can find it at brokenwharf.com. And so you might hear some sounds in the background because our uh, serving boy is uh, preparing supper for us. I kid. It's uh, one of the students and uh, one of our hosts here, uh, Benedict, is cooking some supper and we're sitting here and having a conversation. So first of all, let me welcome our uh, guests. I have uh, with me um, John Mark Allman Smith and Darren Gilchrist. Uh, who are uh, here, uh, who are members of the Trinity Grace Church here in Ramsbottom. So, Darren and John Mark, welcome to Word Magazine. Thank you. It's lovely. Lovely to speak with you. Good. And you're Darren, just I'm for Darren. people who want to pick up on yes. your voice. Yeah. And John Mark, welcome to you. This is what John Mark sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Well, I, I, you guys are involved with the Broken Wharf ministry, and so let's just start with that. So, what, uh, Darren, what's your role with Broken Wharf? So, I'm the general manager at Broken Wharf. Um, I've been doing it for about a year and a half, around about a year and a half. Okay, so you're the general manager. Yes. John Mark, what's your role? My role is is very much unofficial. <laughs> okay. I have, along the whole way, been more of a volunteer but when Broken Wharf began, it was Darren who had the initial idea and then he kind of came to me. And since then, we've basically gone the whole way. So mm. on the one hand, I'm a co-founder. On the other hand, I don't have an official role. <laughs> I just... I just all, you get, yeah. you, so you get all the successes you can take credit for, but all the problems you can say it was, it was Darren's fault. It was Darren right? answers, yeah. He answers for all the issues. There you have it. But yeah. So let me, let me uh, this is the kind of track we're going to take. I want to ask a little bit about you guys. You can share what you want to about, you know, where you are in life and ministry or family. And then we'll talk a little bit about Broken Wharf. And I also want to ask you a little bit about where the confessional Baptist movement is in the UK and uh, what's going on with seminary education with IRBS through Trinity Grace. But let, let's just start with you guys personally. So, so Darren, uh, tell me a little bit about your background. Where are you from? Do you, tell me about your family, whatever you want to share. Yeah, so um, originally I'm from the States, actually. So I moved from Mississippi, New Albany, Mississippi, which is northeast Mississippi, about an hour from Memphis. Uh, I moved in 2010 from there to Cardiff in Wales. Uh, Cardiff is the capital city of Wales, and Wales, which is not in England, by the way. Oh, many, many, yes. many people uh, <laughs> get that wrong. Um, is it okay to say it's in the United Kingdom? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so I moved to Cardiff. I came over originally to do studies at um, uh, the Welsh Evangelical School of Theology. <clears throat> and also to work part-time assisting a minister in the church at St. Mellon's Baptist Church mm. in Cardiff. Uh, now, the, one of the ministers there, the, the man doing the majority of the preaching, actually eventually became my father-in-law. Oh, wow. So uh, mm. I married into the tribe. Okay. So, uh, and that was, yeah, so that was about 2002. So my wife is Rachel. I've got three little ones, one on the way. Wow. And... Um, yeah, and then uh, I pastored for about three years in North Wales. Uh, we moved back down to Cardiff, thinking about maybe going back to the States, um, but uh, decided to stay in Cardiff. And during that time, then we found out about Trinity Grace Church in Ramsbottom. Um, it was during COVID that I really, uh, at the beginning of COVID, came across um, 
the church here and eventually we decided to move up here about two years ago just okay. over two years ago um, and it, for us it was a move because we wanted to be a part of a distinctly confessional Baptist church hmm. uh, the church the church in Cardiff is from a has a history in uh, confessional Baptist life so it would have been a church plant of a church plant of one of the original signatories of the 1689 confession mm. but it really isn't I would say confessional they're not really um, you know they wouldn't be um, actively confessional more of a Lloyd-Jonesian mm. broad evangelical church. Lloyd- Lloyd-Jones is still fondly remembered in, in Wales is that correct? Oh yeah yeah definitely definitely so um, so yeah, he, so yeah, he, yeah. he's still referred to as the doctor. Yeah. So if anyone speaks of the doctor, it is assumed yes. that, that it's, that's who they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, so yeah, so I, I uh, moved here. Yeah, that was two years ago, and then about six months after being here is when I started working with Broken Morph. Okay. Um, I help out in the church with preaching, uh, both at the church and around uh, different struggling congregations yeah. up in this area and actually other places as well. So, hmm. yeah. so tell me about, if you don't mind, how did you come to the faith? When, when you came to Wales in 2010, you already had, you already had a confessional Baptist well, I, sort of framework, or did yeah, you come no, to that while you were in Wales? Yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful that I came personally because I know my character. I'm thankful that I came to confessional convictions being in the UK. Because uh, in America, it can be quite, can be quite trendy, can't it? To right. Be confessional, you know, let's get tattoos of 1689 on our yeah. arms. And mm. Not that I'm against that or anything, but the point <laughs> is, it's, it, it, it's uh, here in the UK, it's really not something that's just nice to do. I think a lot of churches are beginning to realize this. we need this. This mm. is vital, on the ground, hard. I mean, things in the UK, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, are very... Very different than, challenge, in, than yeah. in the in the states, and so I came to confessional convictions later. Um, after being here, actually, I, I would have held a more Lloyd Jonesian view on um, church life, mm. and things like that. So, but, but you came to the faith when you were you were in the I, U.S. When I was in the U.S., so uh, I was in university in Conway, Arkansas. Um, when I think I, at least for the first time, think I heard real genuine preaching. Um, how, how about you tell the audience how many times you were you were rebaptized? Oh during? yeah, yeah. So I was saved and baptized twice before I was ever converted. <laughs> typical, wow. typical Mid South Christianity. I've said a prayer when I was five. I said a prayer when I was a teenager. I was baptized on both occasions. The first time it didn't work. The second time, it's just maybe maybe it worked, but it didn't. You know, it wasn't about it working. <laughs> and, but and this was just the teaching that I had received. Yeah, because it's kind of typical in yeah. some independent Baptist circles. Yes. That they're, yeah, yeah just, very much so. So you can imagine when I actually heard true gospel preaching for the first time, it absolutely threw me. Because I remember the man preaching and thinking, well, hold on, uh, whatever God he has, I want. Mm. But then that made me think, well, wait a minute, what God do I have then? Because right. I thought I had the Christian God, huh. you know, and that started a process of probably a good two and a half years of just stripping God, having to unlearn a lot of wrong views of God. Um, and then when I moved to the church in Mississippi, it was after being there for about three years, uh, about three months, that uh, a group of the men were going through a uh, book study on the glory of Christ by John Owen. Mm. And uh, it was in the midst of the first couple of meetings there that I think for the first time I actually rested in Christ. Mm. Um, before that, there was well, obviously there was conviction going on. There was a hunger for the word. But was I actually resting in the Lord? I don't think mm. when I look back on it, I, I wouldn't have known that at the time. But looking back on it now, I realize, yeah, I, I hadn't really rested in him. Mm. Um, and so that was when I was converted and then. I was at the church for another three, three and a half years before I moved to Cardiff. Okay. So, John Mark, what about you? Tell me, tell us a little bit about your background or, or whatever you want to share about your, your, yourself, your family, your faith. It, it is a very, very different story to mm. Darren. <laughs> right. Mm. Um, yeah, when, when I think about my life up to now, I'm still a, a very young man, really. I'm, I'm nearly 22, but still 21 years, years old. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. I've always lived in Ramsbottom, the town of... <laughs> and, it's, and it's a beautiful town, let me tell you. I've been there this week. It's a gorgeous place. 
it's kind of your, I don't know, I mean, the, the name, Ram's Bottom, it's kind of <laughs> yeah. like you think of an English town, <laughs> yeah. beautiful it is, surroundings, it, it's what very they call green. Quintessentially yeah. English. Yes. Yeah. It, it's the butt end of a lot of jokes, yeah. but it is actually a really beautiful place to live. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and to be in the church here, so uh, my father's been one of the full time elders at the church here for just nearing 25 years now. And being 21, I've been here for most of his pastoral ministry. And as the church has grown uh, into uh, uh, what I would say an increasingly mature confessionalism, I've really grown with that because I've, I've been there for a lot of the journey. Mm. So I was converted roughly at 11 to 12. Obviously, you know, we all go through the different challenges, uh, of particularly of being in high school um, and being confronted with the world. But, you know, the Lord has wonderfully kept me. And really since uh, about 2019, maybe 2020, I've been studying at, at university, been studying theology in the last couple of years. I've begun doing some part-time studies at IRBS and God willing that will become full-time in the next few months. So that's where I am. I work with Darren on the Broken Wharf stuff and it's just a massive privilege to be able to mm. spend a lot of my spare time <laughs> and a lot of time I don't really have spare at all but we just find the time yeah. to nice. work on trying to get these books out and, and trying to promote Resources. this type of theology. Yeah. People in, in Trinity Grace Church and Ramsbottom are not sitting on their hands. They're, <laughs> they're working. It's an active working church, and it's, it's, it's really refreshing to see. Let, let's talk a little bit about the Broken Wharf uh, ministry. So first of all, for those who don't know, what, what's with the name? Why is it called Broken Wharf? What is Broken Wharf? What's the significance of that? Yeah, so Broken Wharf still exists today. Um, if you go to London, in the mainly really right in the center, uh, uh, what, what you might call Old London, um, you have the River Thames running through, and you've got a bunch of different wharfs along mm. the River Thames. And uh, one of those wharfs... Uh, not far from St. Paul's Cathedral, which is quite iconic to the London landscape, not far from there is a, a one big wharf called Queen Hive. Mm. And then about two wharfs over from that is a little wharf called Broken Wharf. Ah. Uh, now, there's debate whether um, why it was called that. Some people, there's, there's books, historical books that say it was, this was where... Um, boats came to be broken down when they were old. They would go into that wharf and they'd take them apart and dismantle them. Others say that the, it used to be a wharf that was a fixed wharf, but it broke. Mm. <laughs> it fell into the River Thames. Right. The wharf broke. The broken, so the wharf. broken wharf. Exactly. There you have it. But more significantly for us, it, in, that, uh, in that little area was a little meeting house um, which a church met at of confessional Baptist and uh, the pastor, well, there were two men that we know of, quite well known as confessional Baptists historically, Hanser Knowles and uh, Robert Steed were ministers of this church. Uh, both of them, Hanser Knowles was a signatory of both the first and second London. I think he was on the first, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, I don't know, actually, if he was on the first, I can't remember. Uh, but he's definitely on the second London for sure. I, I think some people argue that he was an anonymous you know what one of the anonymous men that supported it even if he wasn't yeah. uh, officially one of the signatories yeah yeah so Hansard Knowles was there and it was there at Broken Wharf so there was a meeting house there a church that was gathering there uh, worshiping every lord's day and then when the act of toleration came in remember William and Mary come in um nonconformists now have a bit more freedom and the confession of faith which was originally written in 1677 um, in 1689, they decided, well, let's confess this publicly now. So um, a, a, over a hundred churches were represented by their messengers at this general assembly, and they gathered at the meeting house at Broken Wharf, mm -hmm. and that was where the confession of faith, faith was first um, publicly owned 
right. uh, as their confession. Here's what we believe. We're being very transparent and honest. And of course, there's a whole story behind mm. that, which Doc Renahan oftentimes tells quite and, well. And if you've got uh, a 1689 or a second London Confession of Faith, if you open it up and see the list of signatories, they put their names to that document at Broken Wharf. Mm, mm. So it's really representative of what we're trying to promote, achieve. Uh, it's to mm. be a publisher completely committed to that confession of faith. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's a, that's a really meaningful name mm. for those who weren't aware, aware of it. The site where the 1689 Assembly affirmed uh, the, the confession of faith, at which there's been... You know, we're in the midst of a renaissance of this, mm. a retrieval of our confessional Baptist heritage, mm. both in the United States and the UK, and not just there, all over the world, really. Yeah. It's, it's popping up in, in places all over the place. Yeah. 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 So, um, so this is the name, though, of the publishing ministry. You said it started about a year, year and a half ago? Yeah, informally, it was about a year and a half ago. So what's... Um, sorry, good. Informally, yeah, about a year a year, just in a few months, maybe. What's the first title that came out? Uh, well, it's it's a bit of a tricky question, that, because we did publish titles that were previously published by men, self-published. Right. So we put out, for instance, Sam Renahan's Deity and Decree hmm. and his Mystery of Christ. Um, one of the reasons why Broken Morph also exists is because confessional Baptist books have been difficult to come by in the UK for years. It's notor- It's been sort of, a, yeah, it's notoriously known that if you want a good confessional Baptist book, you have to get it shipped in from the States, and so mm. it ends up costing more just for shipping than the book itself sometimes. So we decided that let's make these things available primarily in the UK and Europe, because we also saw that as a great need uh, in America. Obviously, you guys have a lot of work going on. Mm. S- uh, spiritually, you can afford it at the moment, because... You know, things aren't as thin on the ground. I know this is this is a stereotype, but things aren't as thin on the ground spiritually. So men can afford to spend time, you know, digging into a lot of this. And this is why we're thankful for the guys, like you said, doing the retrieval in the States. It's mm. it's sad that we've had to actually learn from our American brothers about our own confession. About our own confession of faith. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, yeah which was first written over here. Um, and so... Being thankful for the American brothers, we're, um, we were keen to, um, to make these books more available. And, uh, but then our first actual book that was um, published by us, that had never been published before, is a little book called Under God Over the People, which is written by Oliver Allman Smith, so it's John Mark's dad. Um, and it is a book that basically deals with uh, chapter 24 and the relationship between the church and the state. And this was a series of talks that Oliver gave um, providentially just as COVID was hitting. Just before. Yeah, Yeah. just before COVID hit. They just got to chapter 24 in teaching through the confession on midweek midweek meetings, was it? Yeah. And uh, and so we took the talks that he did, the the messages that he preached, really. They're not Mm. talks, they're messages. And... um, and turn them into, you know, book form. Nice. That, that, that's the substance of the book. How many, how many titles total uh, have you done that, uh, have you put out? But both, both reprinting things yeah. that were already done in the U.S. So and I, unique works. Yeah, so I think there's a total, if I, because I lose track of these things. Right. I mean, but, it's um, six or seven, is it? Yeah, six or seven. Do you have like a goal, like produce one a quarter? Is um, that what it is? Eventually, I think we have a goal of doing, you know, a good maybe 12 a year at least. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but we obviously need to build towards that. Right. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big part so of what we're doing now. Th- this year, we've had our first real big push to try and publish some some new literature. We felt like we found our feet last year. So we have... You know, God willing, in the next couple of months, we've we've just had this week. We sent two books to the printers, which has been really exciting. Mm. And you know, God willing, we can have in the next couple of months a, a few new titles. So we've got three, haven't we? We've got mm. the Nehemiah Cox volume, a mm. uh, Vindicie Veritatis, which we've worked on with Doctor Renahan, and we've got a book on missions, on a, mm. a confessional view of missions. That's 
partly a, a biography, but also a biography focused on applying theology. Who's writing that? So that was written by uh, a man named Keith Underhill. So Keith Underhill was a missionary to Kenya for, mm. a, oh, well, since like the 60s. So 30 years, 40 years, yeah, 40 he, he years. He was out there for about 40 years, I think 41 yeah. or 42. And he yeah. planted a church in Nairobi um, originally, and then from that church, other, I don't even know how many churches now. but Well, Kenya. roughly, there would be 20 churches in Kenya now, which wouldn't be there mm. unless he had gone Confessional and Reformed Baptist church. churches. Confessional yeah. Reformed Baptist churches. Not all of them are obviously practicing that confession of faith in a way that we would see as they ought to be. Um, but mm. the church in Nairobi is a thoroughly confessional church. They have an association of churches and they would all at least when they were planted, yeah, be confessional Reformed Baptist yeah. churches. I think I, I think I actually met a brother who came out of that circle of churches who's a member of the Soli Deo Gloria Baptist Church in Budapest. He's right, a young right. man, he's a, a, is an engineer who moved to Budapest and now he's part of, yes. of that church there. So he, mm -hmm. I, I think he moved there to study, Yeah, did he? So, so I, I know of him, a friend of a friend, and he's exactly, I think he's from the church in Nairobi there. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Keith wrote this, this is basically his life work mm. um, from, from before going to Kenya. Um, so he came out of uh, Alfred's Place Baptist Church in Aber okay. Aberystwyth, with Wales, where Jeff Thomas ministered for a good number of years. And the church there at Aberystwyth sent them out to Kenya. That, that was the sending church. Um, and Keith is a lovely, lovely man. They live in Liverpool now. Okay. Um, but uh, he had been for a good number of years working on this. It's a, it's a chunky book. It's, oh. uh, it's <laughs> thick. It's... Uh, you know, it's, it's one that you'd want to use for, you know, church planting missions classes, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because it's so, it's biographical, but then throughout it, there are what they call biblical foundations to church planting mm -hmm. yeah. throughout it. So. I, I want to ask you about, because you, you've also d done an edition of Renahan's Exposition of 1689 for the UK market. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, you've got a series, I, this is one of the first things I saw that you did on social media on Twitter or something like that. You've done a series of confessional titles too, like you've mm. done, a, I'm, I'm holding in my hand uh, a hardback of the 1689 confession and you did a couple mm. other, there was, are they, are they all, some of them are softback, some of them are hardback of yeah. the Do Baptist you know? Catechism and the Keech's Shorter Catechism yeah. and the sure. Orthodox Catechism, yeah. right? You, yeah. So you got a fourfold collection of, of, of uh, symbolic works. Mm. Those four, yeah. So the, the story behind them is that we didn't actually publish those particular volumes, but they were published by some friends of ours, particularly friends of Darren's. Now, Darren was actually involved in their publishing uh, okay. by a small Reformed Baptist publisher called Parisier. Darren was mm. uh, kind of very instrumental in helping them and, and drawing alongside them. We are... Uh, their stock is uh, okay. and so we distribute all their titles for them as, at least in the UK and mm. so we yeah we do a lot of promotion of these books this one's uh, a nice it, it has some distinctive elements to it you've you've got the Baptist confession version uh, in your hand there what what that has that's nice about it is it has the scripture proofs and right. I know that some people would really appreciate that and mm. we've had people who want to buy that one in particular because then they can look down and they can see the scripture proofs almost stated in the King James or there's one reference where it's from the Geneva Bible interestingly yeah. and they picked up on that in the edition mm. so it's a yeah, yeah it's a really nice book are you familiar with what particular heritage uh, Baptist uh, they, yeah, yeah. They obviously books. through I mean we, we're on social media so occasionally things will pop up and we'll go oh there's something going on there in yeah. the state, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and I think a few of the titles have come over here through one of the retailers mm. over here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, we, we have heard of them. Yeah, they, and they've also produced volumes, hardback mm. volumes that have the script, the proof text. They have a King James version and Do New they? King James version. Yeah, yeah, I right. noticed yeah, that one. recently. Yeah. So these brothers are in Scotland. Okay. Um, and when they published this work, both of them were church planting, and we base. Well, I, I kind of came alongside them and said, "Look, how can I help?" Scotland is very difficult spiritually. It's a very spiritual, barren place. 
uh, as a lot of the UK is, but particularly very anti anti gospel. And we were basically wanted to say to them, look, you guys are church planning, you're pastoring, you're parenting. How can we help? You know, and so we basically said, let us warehouse and distribute and do all that for you. Yeah. All the behind the scenes work so that you can just focus on what you're doing. And I, another, I, another, before we get talk about the Renahan book, I had also picked up this uh, this title. I think it's relatively new. You guys are putting together. It's called Christian Basics. John Hall and Oliver Allman Smith. Tell me about this book. What is it about? So Christian Basics, this is actually the second edition. Mm. Um, Christian Basics was originally written by John Hall um, a number of years ago, actually, um, and has oftentimes been used for, um, it's, it's really good for new membership, maybe classes, yeah. uh, introducing people to the basics of Christianity. Um, and it's been, you know, we as a church, for instance, would use it in our new members' classes. Mm. Yeah, I'd say uh, 71 pages in length. With questions, I, I'm, I I got a copy myself. I'm going to go home and read it, and it looks like it might be something that would be good in discipleship or a new member class or something like that. I mean, the, the wonderful thing about that book in particular is that it's been used all over the world before we've even looked at it and done a few slight edits, kind of worked through it and, and published it as Broken Wharf. Mm. And it means that there are a lot of people who have already found the book helpful. It's... In many ways, I think it it's correct to say that it's been in circulation for maybe even 20 years now or something huh. like yeah. that. And so it's kind of tried and tested. Right. And so it's been a, a wonderful thing to be able to almost be given that work yeah. and to pick it up and try and promote it just for use in churches and so things the, like that. So this second edition is by John Hall, and you'll notice, and Oliver Oldman Smith. So what Oliver did basically is help sort of do some of the editing and... We made the confessional theology behind it a little bit more explicit in the right. book. Um, it was already there, but John Hall, when he originally wrote it, was a man of his day, and there was really no need at that time. Right. Uh, whereas now there's more of a confessional emphasis, uh, at least explicitly. Uh, and it's a really good book in that sense, then, in, in terms of on ramping people onto confessional Christianity. Because mm-hmm. um, a lot of people are, feel a bit, yeah. you know. Oh, it, for whatever reason, they might feel off put it, you know, be put, be put off confessional Christianity. This is a really helpful book to kind of gently introduce them to confessional theology. Um, one of the books to, to talk about, and I said we would talk about it a few minutes ago, is uh, Dr. James Renahan has just come out in the U.S. I guess it's, it's, it's listed as being printed in 2022, but I don't think it started to be really widely distributed till January or so of this year, 2023. But it's his uh, uh, exposition of the Second London Confession. It's kind of a volume two in a series that he did with, with Founders Press in, in Florida. Um, it's, a, it's a thorough um, exposition of the Second London Confession, drawing on Jim's, I guess, career, really, of studying this. I think probably he's probably the, 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 the most able person in the world right now in knowing the history behind the Confession of Faith and the, and the interpretation of it. But anyways, um, that's in, in the U.S., Founders is distributing it. Mm. But in the U.K., you guys have come out with a U.K. edition. Um, yeah. It's a beautiful edition. Oh. It's a nice hardbound book. It's got a ribbon. It's got a ribbon. Yeah. got a ribbon. You can't go wrong with the it's, ribbon. It's got an embossed... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, cover on the back and so tell me about how that came about uh, with uh, this volume well for us it was a really simple one because we want to promote confessional Baptist Christianity we want that to uh, become you know normal in our churches for people to you know find their confessional roots again and see theology through this lens and obviously we've known, you know, Jim, I call him Doc. Uh, we, we've known Doc for years and years now. And it's just been a privilege to learn so much from him. And when we saw that he was bringing out this work, we viewed it very much. I know Darren might want to add something, but we viewed it very much as the backbone to all our publishing efforts. Mm-hmm. We think that if we can bring out 
an addition of that which can last for years and years, which mm. can really be the backbone of all the other things that we produce, we can't go far wrong, especially mm. with, as you mentioned, how qualified Jim is mm. to write the book, how many years of experience he's had studying the confession. Yeah. So it's been nothing but a privilege to do that book, mm. and we really envisage that being a book that, for as long as we're around, we will be publishing, yeah. basically. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So uh, let me ask you this. I want to talk a little bit about confessional Baptist life in the UK. But so you, you've got this fledgling publishing ministry. Um, how have the books been received by people in the UK? Have you found interest? You, are, are you going to do? Are you doing conference tables? Are you? How are you promoting the literature that you produce thus far? And how's it been received by Christians and churches? Yeah. So I would say. I think it's important to understand that we don't exist in a vacuum. So Broken Morph emerged out of, in parallel with two other things that developed. One of those being discussions on association, the Confessional Baptist Association, but also IRBS UK, um, the seminary which you're here teaching this week for. Uh, So this is sort of a third thing that's happening alongside those two things. When When the churches were getting together, and you know, having these discussions, those who were involved already had an interest of wanting you know, to see more confessional Baptist material available. Um, the timing just up until a year and a half ago really just hadn't, you know, in God's providence, it, it just um, hadn't really come about. And so, but with, but with, as the association develops, as IRBS UK develops, I think what we're seeing is that the publishing is also developing. And so in terms of how it's being received, it's like, in the, I would say it's similar to how the association and how IRBS UK is being received. And that is to say that there is a small but growing interest at the moment. Because hmm. uh, we, we're really here in the UK starting out really at ground zero again when it comes to confessional Baptist stuff. That's it. Just to build on what Darren's saying, this association of churches, we have three churches, we hope that there will be four or five in the next few months because we've got another meeting in June and there are churches who are applying. And this association will have been, as far as we're aware, the first association of confessional Baptist churches in hundreds of years in this mm-hmm. country. Mm-hmm. And so we very much see Broken Wharf as coming alongside that, coming alongside mm-hmm. Reformed Baptist training, uh, very much not in the progressive sense, but in just the sense of we're trying to move forward in, in this movement of mm. recovery. Mm. Uh, and so there's almost a twofold aspect to it. On the one hand, mm. we're trying to get out there to really spread this message, to try and get this good theology kind of in people's churches, in people's homes, really in their minds, but also just try to serve the confessional Baptist churches here. So on the one hand, almost trying to get it out there, but on the other, just trying to help, you know, a, very much our own church too, yeah. come mm-hmm. to a maturity and to kind mm-hmm. of better understand these well, things. Well, I was going to ask, and maybe you've already really addressed it, you know, I was going to ask, what is the state of the confessional Baptist movement in the UK? I mean, it is kind of weird. I mean, this it's the second London Baptist Confession <laughs> of Faith. I mean, yeah. the roots of the, of our movement is in England and we've had, I guess, um, we've, we've had in God's providence this revival of interest in confessionalism among Baptist churches in the U.S. Mm. So that, you know, it's, it's really been brewing probably since the 1950s mm. and has, you know, gained acceleration probably really in the last 30 years. I was telling some Somebody earlier, uh, one of the pastors who was uh, here for the uh, class, Pete, mm. that you know when we started the our annual Keach conference in Virginia twenty plus years ago, there were only a, a, a handful of of confessional Reformed Baptist churches, mm. and you know I think now there are probably fifteen. <laughs> mm, um, so it went from, went from two or three to 15 in about 20 years yeah, time yeah. and it's and it's continuing to grow yeah, that's um, great. so but but anyways it's kind of we, we would think yeah this is the motherland yeah. well what happened it's, mm. it's just funny thinking of this week isn't it I mean I, I don't know how how long was your flight over from from Virginia to get here 
I mean, it really wasn't that long from DC to to what well, DC to London, then London to Manchester. I, I don't know, you know. I mean, the flight was maybe seven or eight hours from yeah. from the U.S. to mm. to to London, then a transfer mm. to get here. But because it, it's amazing that we're, we're in the state now where we have to fly someone over on a plane for eight hours to come and teach us about our own confession of faith. Mm. Basically, that that's the state that we're in. And on the one hand, it's absolutely wonderful to be able to receive that teaching and the fact that we can do that today where they couldn't have done that in the 17th century Mm. it would have taken them by boat you know months but on the other hand it is it just shows the reality of the work here we are very much in a, a baby stage and you know it was interesting when Darren was telling the story about that church in Cardiff it's almost an analogy for confessionalism in this country at the moment Mm. a lot of churches have it in their heritage but there is total ignorance and Mm. on on the whole a complete disagreement with the theology of the so so a church a church an existing church might have the 1689 as its confession but it's not but it's kind of there and not not much attention has been given to it in so decades. The, yeah, so over mm-hmm. here, um, you know, you will have churches who have the confession of faith actually in their legal trust deeds, mm. and that would be historic. That's historical, right? You know, so whatever happens with this church building, this chapel, mm-hmm. which you know over here is hundreds of years old. You know, you're talking about some chapels from the 1700s, um, but the 1689 would be in the trusted legal trust deed, and so whatever happens to the chapel has to happen. But then what that means actually really has completely been lost. Mm. And so there's not a real understanding. So I think one of the difficult things I often find, because I'm originally from the States, I kind of I find that I have sort of two hats that I sometimes have to wear. <laughs> I have to I, sometimes I'm thinking in my American hat and then my wife has to remind me, get that hat off. You're not in America. Oh, yeah, that's right. OK, <laughs> put my UK hat on. Um, and I think that what a lot of people don't realize over here is obviously things in the UK amongst evangelicals developed quite differently than it did in the US Um, and obviously we had the influence of men like Martin Lloyd-Jones and Mm. a generation of men in the UK who by and large when you compare it to guys uh, and evangelicalism in the States were actually solid men Mm -hmm. really solid men which we're thankful for and there is a sense in which what we're doing is really seeking to pick up the, the mantle from from those men and seek to build on their, because yeah. because Lloyd Jones had many strengths. He was an excellent preacher. Um, you know his emphasis on because uh, because he was involved in recovering the doctrines of grace in the mm. UK. He, he brought us banner of truth, and yeah. without Lloyd Jones, mm. we think, as far as we're aware, we wouldn't exist today. Yeah, but obviously he's working alongside the likes of Ian Murray and. Jeff Thomas and, you know, all these other men who we know of in, in sort of the Lloyd-Jones era. But what, we, but it, what I think a lot of people don't understand is Lloyd-Jones wasn't confessional. Um, he, he, he acknowledged the confessions. He acknowledged the Westminster Confession of Faith. He himself was from a Calvinistic Methodist background which based their confession of faith on the Westminster Confession. But the... The, the kind of ecclesiology that he argued for in the book, for instance, called Knowing the Times, is mm. what he calls, his words, ecumenical evangelicalism. Mm-hmm. That's what he argued for, which was not the same as... In fact, he actually, in some places, has a bit of a, a, bit of a jab at confessional Christianity. Yeah. But then you've got to remember, these men had not seen real healthy confessional Christianity in their era. All they knew was liberalism in the Baptist Union, in the um, Methodist Church, in the Anglican Church, obviously, in uh, lots of circles like this. So, so what con- confessional Christianity like? Yeah, that mm. was in one sense very, very unfamiliar. So territory. it's the it's the infant stages of of a the development or the growth of a of a confessional reformed Baptist movement in the UK. Mm. So. Aside from the from those sort of issues, mm. what are the spiritual needs of people who live in the United Kingdom right now? What is what is it like? What's the spiritual state of the nation and the state of the the church apart from 
you know, talking about the development of, of evangelical or, or of confessional reform Baptist churches. So I think that the way I often explain it is, and again, remember, I'm from the mid south in the states, so I know this isn't always this the case, but where I'm from in the states, you can sort of compare that part of the vineyard to a very, from a distance, a very leafy. You know, look at all this life. Look at all these plants that seem to be growing in this vineyard. And then you get up close and you realize the majority of it's weeds that mm. just haven't died yet. Mm. And really, there's actually few real flowers amongst the weeds. Whereas over here, um, Christianity across the board, it's like a rocky part of the vineyard. It's dead. Completely barren. And really, what you have occasionally is between the cracks, an occasional flower cropping up and that's what it's like over here so there's a sense in which more so than in the states what you see is what you get whereas in the states oftentimes you get a lot of profession of christianity but a lot of that's just american christianity it's not biblical christianity right here you, here you don't get people professing christianity oh no you, they would no. think you're weird so for instance to give you an example in mississippi uh, if somebody was running for mayor Oftentimes, you know how they go around and they put door hangers on the door, or they'll put, you know. Right. It always says what local church they go to. You know, right. I, I grew up in such and such church. And if they didn't put something like that, you would kind of go, ooh, suspect. Mm -hmm. Whereas over here, if you did that, people would go, they go to a church? That's suspect. Huh. You know, they just look at it as completely weird that, uh, you know, because Christianity really is uh, well we're not uh, and we're not in a post-christian culture we're in an anti-christian culture that's it we we've mm. gone past what you would call a post-christian culture at least in how i've heard a lot of people use the phrase i know people use it differently no. but the, uh, to balance that though there is still a strong independency in this country obviously it depends on what you mean by strong but mm. you go to you know, most towns and there will be some form of independent evangelical church and there will be some gospel preaching. Maybe the sermon's only 15 minutes, but there will be gospel preaching there to an extent. Mm. So that there is still, you know, a, a strong backbone to independent evangelicalism here, but it is still obviously in relation to the... Yeah. Um, the population of the country absolutely yeah, and, it's, and it's it's a country that's had a christian heritage mm, yes, there's yeah. the remnants of that in yeah. whether it's standing public church buildings yeah. and influences yeah. you know back decades centuries even in the culture so i was just going to say what what you have now is um you know a an evangelicalism which was built by lloyd jones um, in many, many ways, and those men who were involved with all that, but um, it's very, um, it's. I think you could. I think it would be safe to say there is a slight drift um, amongst a lot of the evangelical churches because things have been divorced from their confessional moorings, mm -hmm. and so there is this sort of little bit of of drift. And obviously, with technology, more and stuff from America comes over often, and we get influenced by that. There's a lot of an American. American influence as well. So, so we talked about Broken Wharf. We talked a little bit about the this uh, nascent association that's in the infant stages, um, and a little bit about the theological education. IRBS is doing uh, classes. They're meeting at, at. Have all the meetings been at the Trinity Church in Ramsbottom? Have there been meetings done? All in other of them places? have. That mm -hmm. was. A launch of what you might call IRBS UK, and that happened in Westminster. So I, I believe that may have even happened in Westminster Chapel that first week where Jim came and taught his symbolic mm. course. Westminster Baptist Church, yeah, maybe. Maybe it was Westminster yes. Baptist yeah. Church. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but since then, yes, it, it's based at Trinity Grace Church Ramsbottom. That's the local church that look after the, the work of IRBS on this side of the pond. Yeah. I know there are about a dozen students there this week, including a couple of uh, young men who are mm. in pastoral ministry, who are uh, embracing confessional theology, and a couple of young men who are, who are preparing for the ministry. Mm. Uh, so it was encouraging. 
to be there this week and to learn together with you guys. I, I, for our listeners, um, let's let's say somebody wants to get your books. How do they find your books? Uh, let's say somebody out there wants to get the UK edition of, of Renahan's work. Uh, they, they, yeah. They're collectors. They've got they've got the American edition, but they want the UK edition, or they want some of the. They just want to see your titles and find them. How do they, how do they find them? So obviously, you can go to uh, brokenwharf.com, and again, wharf is spelt with the old English, so it's w h a r f e dot com. Uh, we're on social media. We have a mailing list. You got a podcast too, right? We have two podcasts. We have the Broken Morph podcast and the Coffee House sessions. Well, I, I was going to say, keep your eyes on that podcast because I'm about to ask Dr. Riddle the minute this goes off whether he'll come on <laughs> for an episode in the near future. So you might find that interesting. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So you can, yeah, you can find us there. Um, we do have a U.S. distribution hub, um, so some of our titles are available in the states. And they get shipped from the states to people. But you do that um, through the Broken Through Warp. the Broken Wharf website. If yeah. you go to the bookshop, we have three uh, bookshops. We have a UK, a US, and an Australia bookshop. Uh, and the US bookshop, if you clicked on that, for instance, uh, you'd be able to see which titles are available. We're going to make more titles over time. Because, vindic- uh, not vindication, uh, Judicious and Impartial Reader is already available through Founders... The only way you can get that one is really if you contact us and we can quote you for international shipping. But I forewarn you. It would be costly. It will be costly. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so that's, um, that's how you can access. What if we have somebody out there who's just independently wealthy and wants to give a gift to help the ministry keep going? What do they do? Well, you can contact us at um, brokenwharf.com. Um, and we have, our email is info at brokenwharf.com. And you can just email, let us know what you're thinking. We can discuss that and go from there, really. So, and buy lots of books. Yeah, <laughs> we we wanna we wanna get the books out there. So yeah. yeah, I mean, it does cost to get large pallets of books sent over from here to there. So that you know, that's an expense that's always on the back in the back of our minds. Yeah, we're gonna have to get these books over there. So right. well, many of our churches have. If not bookstores, book racks, and you know, obviously, you know something about confessional Christianity. I mean, it appeals to the heart and mm. it appeals to the head. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and we, it, you know, we, we want to know the faith. And we want to we want to rightly divide the word, and we mm. want to we want to rightly teach it. So there's there, it's a it's a it's a good ministry to support Reform Baptist cause. That's for mm. sure. Mm. Well, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to bring this to a conclusion. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Word Magazine. I hope this has been edifying for those who are listening, and I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next issue of Word Magazine, although it will not be this lovely garden spot that I am in right now in Ramsbottom. I'll be back. Virginia is a pretty beautiful place, too. But anyways, Mm. till the next Word Magazine, take care, and may the Lord richly bless you.